Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening or good morning, um, depending on your uh, location in the world. Um, today I'll be talking about failure analysis of, for our industry, electronic systems using ion chromatography and ion chromatography mass spec. Um, I've been running ion chromatography systems since the, well, since 1986 um, and uh, have used uh, thermal systems um, consistently, but have worked with other systems and, and found uh, a lot of uh, interest in the industry, in our electronics industry, in, in using tools that allow us to quantify and speciate the different ionic and organic residues. Today we'll be talking about three different uh, case studies using both IC and IC mass spec to look at and see how we can extend or understand the effects of the process. Um, we'll talk about technology changes um, in the electronics industry from the mid-80s to today. We'll look at a definition of cleanliness. We'll talk about traditional testing. Um, historical industry uh, tools and monitoring techniques, uh, new tools, um, and we'll look at these three case studies that we talked about. And then we'll talk about some of the elements that we find are uh, better designed for understanding reliability impacts and reliability risk ahead of putting a, a piece of hardware in the field. In the electronics industry, a lot has changed. Um, not only have we changed um, from a leaded to a lead-free uh, soldering world, which changes the soldering temperatures, um, but we've changed the, the realm of cleaning and not cleaning. And historically, the industry up until 1991 cleaned 100% of the circuit boards um, that were manufactured for high reliability hardware. Everything was cleaned in either Freon or 111 trichloroethane. Um, we had a lot of uh, uh, historical data with high solids, raws, and fluxes using tools that, that allowed us to um, create a, uh, a good solder joint um, with a wave solder process and some early solder uh, pace and reflow conditions, um, but after the Clean Air Act came in, in in 1987, the industry started moving and transitioning between 1990 and 1992 to everything that was new. Um, it was a, a huge disruption in the, the, the technology, um, so a lot of people went to no clean, so we didn't have to invest in new cleaning systems. Um, so no clean fluxes, low solids, no rosin um, that weren't solvent cleaned that were allowed to leave residues on the board and have a, uh, a insulated protective residue was the, the marketing uh, term. The reality behind those no clean flux residues meant that you had to have good clean hardware coming in, good clean boards, good clean components and fully heat activate the, the flux so that it was benign. Um, since 1991, um, we started our company in 90, yeah, 92. We found that there's a lot of dirty incoming boards, dirty components, dirty um, uh, flux application issues um, that have created a huge shift in reliability issues. Um, the other issue is cleanliness monitoring. We've been using tra traditional tools for monitoring the cleanliness of a circuit board, which is just pouring some alcohol and water over the surface of an assembly or a bare board, and then we would uh, measure the resistivity change before and after. So the looking at that delta, then using a, a very complex calculation and uh, algorithm, we would come up with a, a function of is this clean or dirty. Um, but it never correlated to reliability or predictability of the field performance. It just was a, a general gauge to say, was the system cleaning as well as it did before, again, using solvent systems with rosin fluxes. So a lot of things have changed in our industry. 
we have seen um, shifts. Uh, we'll come back to that one. Um, in the technology, here's a 1991 uh, rosin flux uh, photo on the left of a telecommunication uh, router board. And then on the right, we have a, a, a server, um, just a small section of a server uh, board where it was all built with no clean fluxes in 2017. Uh, very similar to what we're seeing today. Um, this board was probably 12 layers compared to the 24 layers that we're doing today. Um, the board on the left was probably three or four layers, probably a four-layer board um, at best, and it didn't need to be that complex or that complicated. So there's a huge difference in component spacing and component architecture and entrapment issues and the size of the components. We, we reduce the size of the components so we have more places for flux to um, be trapped, but we also have a smaller space for reactions to occur between anode and cathode and set up a corrosion cell. And we'll be talking about electrochemical migration, dendritic growth, which are the same thing, um, parasitic leakage, and the events that it cause reliability issues to uh, have traces corrode open um, and then grow dendrites through or from that, that open copper. The issues of cleanliness as they impact reliability, um, typically the, the relationship between the amount of, of surface contamination and the probability of, of electrochemical migration um, has always been understood but never well quantified. And when I first started doing ion chromatography, I was very uh, shocked to see our industry was not able to quantify chloride or sulfur or sodium um, residues from a manufacturing process on a circuit board. Um, and to look at it as an overall cleanliness of this whole circuit board itself, we would take and assess the effect of where the contamination um, was coming from. Um, and in many cases in today's hardware, uh, we see two or three locations that will have a dendrite short as we see here um, on this area where the dendrite basically came from contamination that was trapped in the, the via um, and migrated out due to the uh, uh, unreacted flux that was trapped in the via from the bottom side soldering, uh, waste soldering operation. So taking a look at, at knowing these levels of contamination, understanding what their, their effect is on a localized level um, doesn't correlate or didn't correlate um, uh, historically to the amount of predictable reliability. In traditional tools, again, we used a, a, what's called a ROSE method, resistivity of solvent extract poured alcohol water at room temperature over the surface of the board, collected it, and then dropped it um, into some magical algorithm and said, okay, here's what the effect of the residues are, and here's how we can um, understand what that, that value means. When we shifted to no cleans and water-soluble fluxes in the 90s, we, all those relationships and all that historical data really did not translate, and we didn't get good correlation to those types of tools, even though the IPC and the industry still accepted them. Um, so, but they were the only tool that was available in, in that time frame, and, and so everybody was still trying to figure out how to make it work with the new fluxes and, and new technology. This little image here shows where flux residues underneath a connector um, that passed the ROSE test, um, were high enough to absorb moisture and set up a corrosion cell on a 200-volt uh, input where the connector um, would actually set up and corrode a dendrite underneath and then catch the connector on fire and cause these, these units to fail in the field in a relatively short period of time, within two hours. Most people think about cleanliness as, as a general term, um, and it's really ambiguous in our industry, so we, we, we are trying to develop better 
understanding of how the, the, the issue of cleanliness is directly related to reliability. And if you've got enough moisture, if you've got enough voltage differential, and if you've got enough corrosive residue, you've got the, the right recipe for creating a, a, a dendrite or creating a condition where the, the failure is actually going to uh, occur, but it's always in a localized area. So we've taken the approach to isolate and, and extract residues from specific areas with a steam uh, approach. We've developed and, and had a, uh, a tool for the last 20 years on the market for process monitoring and failure analysis to assess what those residues are and how we can look at them. And comparing them to traditional rows or surface insulation resistance um, type measurements, they're, they're completely different. These are general average, um, both electrical or, or uh, chemical uh, assessments. Um, when I developed and, and published the first ion chromatography test method for the IPC back in 1994, um, we were doing bag extractions of the total board trying to correlate to that ROSE test. Uh, again, using isopropyl alcohol at 75%, DI water at 25%, letting it soak for an hour at 80 degrees C, um, just so we could get 95% of the ionics that were extractable off in the first hour. And then when we did the second extraction and third extraction and fourth extraction, we got less um, from that surface. So we would look at the, the, the original analysis and start saying, okay, with rosin fluxes, we could get a really good um, reaction and see what the fluxes were and see what, what things were doing. But we didn't have any real big problems in the 80s. When we started switching to no cleans and, and started switching away from rosin-based fluxes, we started seeing great numbers of reliability uh, recalls and failures um, with dendrite growth and corrosion issues and parasitic leakage issues. Um, and we knew that we had to go and look at things with a, a better tool and a better approach. Taking the technology that changed, um, and again, I know for this audience, um, you're not as aware of some of the technology issues that, that, uh, that we can get into the, the details of. Um, but no clean fluxes, lead free solders, um, the, the development of QFNs and micro BGAs and flip chip packages and bottom terminated components, um, all of those structural changes created new and more uh, impactful uh, entrapment areas with extremely high levels of sensitivity. So now we have a very sensitive look, uh, device with a critical uh, opportunity for trapping residues underneath that device, and we had really no good tool to process, monitor, or assess what was going on from that step of the process. And so if we change everything in manufacturing and technology and we don't change the way we monitor things and we see more failures, that means our monitors are not working, our process understanding is not uh, where it needs to be. Um, and even with the basic ion chromatography, we knew that we were not seeing some of the things that we could see that would help us understand why we were seeing some dendritic growth or parasitic leakage in things that had low levels of chloride. And typically the, the primary corrosion mechanism uh, was one of the halides, either fluoride, chloride, uh, bromine, um, with a, an amine hydro uh, structure. So we would have an amine hydrochloride uh, flux activator from a hassle process that would be left on with a polyglycol carrier. Those are very moisture absorbing residues and if they're not properly rinsed on a bare board from a hassle process step, they get to be uh, very uh, good failures very quickly. Um, but with components trapping these fluxes where they're not allowing them to transition in temperature because they're so tight to the board surface, we see the effect of the, the residue and as its impact on performance growing these dendrites um, and shorting underneath the package itself even though everything else on the board is fully functional and, and performed great. 
we talk about contamination and residues, um, and this is a short list, uh, kind of an overview of, of each step of the manufacturing process and a no clean assembly um, creates uh, a chemical signature. And from a cell analysis lab standpoint, I need to understand and have analytical tools to understand what kind of uh, planning chemistries are we dealing with? What kind of organics are we getting and dealing with? What are the etchants and the, the water quality issues? Some of the um, best circuit boards have come out of uh, some places that use DI water, ultra pure DI water, throughout the manufacturing process. Some of the worst places uh, that produce circuit boards um, come out of places that are using tap water or even Chicago River water or Penang River water um, to rinse those boards. Um, and even when we have good DI water as a primary source, a lot of these board fabricators will use a cascade forward system where they have three tanks or four tanks of dirtier levels of water that they'll just recirculate and use to knock off the, the, the initial level of contamination, not realizing that these things will build up a lot of contamination very quickly, and now we're just puking more contamination on the boards, creating a whole other set of problems. So, Board fabrication, component fabrication, plating issues, uh, fluxes, as we said, um, cleaning processes. There's still about 25% of the industry that cleans um, circuit board uh, assemblies for high reliability hardware. Um, and, and we are seeing more and more people move to that because of the high reliability issues. Um, we have a lot of conformal coatings that are trapping residues or the monomers are reacting with the flux residues that are there, setting up corrosion cells underneath the, the, the sample itself. Um, staking compounds, outgassing issues, temporary maskings, and then the enclosures, the, the hardware that we put the, the electronics in, uh, the plastics, the, the uh, vibration dampening foams, all those things have a tendency to outgas. Well, I'll get sulfur, well, I'll get chlorine, well, I'll get acetate, and those things also set up corrosion cells. Um, those chemicals, so understanding what those elements are, really allow us to be able to come back in, use a localized extraction, see the corrosion site, and come in and say, okay, this residue came from this step in the process, and we go back to that process or that material, and we can then make that change remove that from the, the, the product, bring in new product the, or new materials or new processes that are cleaner and be able to, to improve that process. And that's how we've been successful for the last 29 years. Moving on. Cleanness assessment, you know, what is the circuit board cleanliness um, and, and how do we assess it and how do we know what the difference is between good and bad? It all boils down to understanding what level of contamination is present to set up that corrosion cell. So using tools that we've developed, we can actually create an electrical response to see what causes the conditions for dendritic growth. Doing failure analysis for so long, we've been able to go in, analyze these types of failures where the dendrite that caused the short of the hardware, and this is the uh, a part has been removed from this called a QFM, um, and it had a, a, a dendrite grow in, in a fielded application and cause these things to, to short on an automotive application. And, and we found that this level of contamination of the weak organic acids were extremely high, were not properly heat activated and set up that corrosion cell. The same with this other dendrite growing underneath this hazy uh, material, which is the conformal coating. We were able to see the reaction between the monomer and the, the coating of, from the coating um, react with the flux residues that were not fully heat activated. Now we have weak organic acids, succinic and adipic and, and uh, malic in this case, um, set up a corrosion cell and grew dendrites within 24 hours of going into the field with a uh, gas meter system. So it's, it's learning how and understanding these types of systems. We create tools, um, I'm not sure why my, my uh, picture got moved. Um, we create tools to look at where these contamination issues are 
we bring the the steam down through this test cell on the C3 head. We let it soak for 20 seconds, and then we then aspirate it off the board surface, put an electrode um, that's sacrificial in that solution. We collect 2.2 mils of solution um, with 250, mil, well, 250 microliter cycles of extraction solution, which is ultra-pure DI water that shows less than um, typically one PPB or five PPB of any anion or cation that we can detect. Um, and so when we, we introduce this to the surface at 175 um, degrees Fahrenheit, typically by the time it goes to the system, it starts out as steam and ends up as a very, very hot um, steam aliquot or uh, dispensed hot water. We let it soak for 20 seconds, we aspirate it off, and then we collect it. 2.2 mils sit in this collection reservoir. We apply a 10 volt bias and we see how long that takes for it to, to, to function. So with the C3, we're able to isolate those areas and then see what those reactions are. When we take a look at the effect, now we're monitoring the corrosivity of that solution. We're monitoring how much microamps of current leakage we see between that 50 mil spaced gap electrode and we can look at the effect of how the time interval and the reaction, and we've chosen 250 microamps of current for a event. So we know that we can see dendrites growing and shorting at 250 microamps. So the faster that occurs, the greater level that we have is contamination. The longer it takes, the cleaner it is. And so we've been able to establish between 120 seconds and 180 seconds that the good DI water um, will have a good clean um, run, and we define it as clean, and anything that's less than 120 seconds is considered dirty. So we look at those kinds of residues, and we've come up with a corrosivity index where you can actually just plot your values based on um, the current divided by time. Um, so we can see what that, that reading is. We all know what ion chromatography and, and how wonderful the, the system is, um, but it has its limitations. And that's been one of the struggles that I've had trying to deal with just conductivity. And I've tried uh, a variety of, of analytical systems um, to quantify and speciate and separate out. And, and I get collusion issues with methane sulfonic acid and forming. I get collusion issues with sulfate and some of the organic acids. Um, Everyone was surprised when we started uh, reporting that we could see the organic acids, succinic, malic, adipic, um, on the um, AS22 column. Um, and we have a 17-minute uh, run with an isocratic system with a bicarb carbonate eluent. We're able to see those, those uh, very effectively and get a good run in our system. But it wasn't until we introduced ion chromatography mass spec into our system um, where we ran a separate IC system and a separate mass spec um, away from our standard ICS 3000 and 5000 system. And we were really surprised to see that we could see chlorate, chloride. We could look at some of the other elements and get better separation and great separation between the organic acids. And with 29 channels, we're seeing 19 of those as uh, organic acids, and we've got 10 set up for just the primary anions. And we've been really developing and using this technique, and a lot of uh, companies are really glad that we're able to now speciate and look at ratios of fluxes and say, okay, now I can tell the difference between a surface mount solder paste flux that's been fully heat activated versus one that's been partially heat activated, um, looking at a pen and paste process where they reflow the top side of the board um, and the solder paste runs down the hole, the through hole, and ends up with flux on the bottom side of the board. Well, the flux on the top side that saw all the primary reflow heat is good and benign and protective. And the stuff that's on the bottom side of the board is not as fully heated and is very moisture absorbing and has set up corrosion cells. So we can look at that partial degradation of that flux 
and see the reaction and ratio differences of extractable residues. So using the, the C3 and steam extraction, we're able to go in and, and look at and understand, okay, why we see dendrites growing here versus why don't we see things here? And we can see certain ratios and see the fact that some of those degradation products um, are not present in the, the good areas and some of the degradation products and some of the byproducts that, that are coming from these reactions are still very reactive in the bottom side. So we can see those kind of differences and see how that affects the uh, performance as it relates. Again, um, our standard IC mass spec uh, with the auto sampler, a uh, wonderful tool. Um, it's a 40 minute run versus a 17 minute run. So we don't run 100% of everything we do because we do have two IC systems running usually 20 to 24 hours a day uh, with a couple hundred analysis. Um, so we do see a lot of uh, uh, systems. We probably run more IC analysis um, than a lot of labs uh, around the world. What we can see between the IC mass spec and what we see with just IC, um, looking at the, the primary anions um, and, you know, just looking at that. And our system is only set up for, IC mass spec is only set up for anions. We don't have a cation side of that. So looking for um, that as well. I want to see what else I'm not seeing. Um, but these are the, some of the organic acids that we deal with um, and some of the things that will co-elute with certain elements. And right now we try to dial everything in so it, a lot of these organic acids will come out as a, um, a co-eluting element with uh, succinate um, or succinic acid and will just have a, a single value for that peak um, based on, on succinic acid. It creates the condition, um, at least allows us to say, historically, where are we at with a, a water extraction on that sample? Um, and then we can go and speciate it and look. But we've set limits as to what level is good and what level is bad based on the weak organic acids and have found that for a surface mount process, 25 micrograms per square inch of weak organic acid which is the collective of the, all the different organic acids from the different fluxing processes, um, we can see that on the surface. Um, and anything that's above 150 micrograms per square inch from a wastewater process is considered to be corrosive and conductive as well. And that has some variability, but it, those seem to have played out very well historically. We talked about ion chromatography um, as a failure analysis tool. And when, one of the cases that we've had to work um, repeatedly um, over the years is let's take a burnt board and figure out what happened to it, compare it to a current production board and see what's different between the current production and the failed board and see if there's any similarities. And using both the IC and the IC mass spec, we're able to see certain key changes. Um, so if we look at the data from the bare board, and this is all in micrograms per square inch. So what we've done is we've taken the part per billion or part per million level um, output from the IC, and we have taken the volume extraction in the surface area, which is 2.2 mils of dead water and 0.1 square inch area, and be able to convert that into a micrograms per square inch ratio um, to look at that as a, as a normalizing effect over larger or comparative to larger areas. The uh, failure, we saw high levels of bromine, which is typical um, for a board that has been burnt. The, the bromine is a flame retardant built into the system. Um, it's designed to help minimize the thermal events, and so we see high levels outgassing from a, a board that has had some thermal event. But what we typically don't see are high levels of weak organic acid. So looking at what these weak organic acids are, you know, will help us understand, you know, and we compare that to the good board, the current production board, where they had levels that were, you know, less than 25, um, where the sodium levels were high as well. So if we look at the touch-up repair flux um, that they used, it was high in weak organic acids and high in sodium as well. It showed dirty in the C3, 
just like the samples from the, the failure. So what we believed happened is that there was a, uh, a, a localized rework area nearby and it was brush cleaned into this area and set up a corrosion cell on a very critical um, part of the circuit within three or four um, seconds after this unit was powered up, it created a, it blew the, the capacitor right off the board surface. Um, so looking at the, the IC mass spec data um, and taking a look at, and this is just nine, or I'm sorry, this is, uh, this should be 19 channels um, of the 29 that we see. So I wanted to kind of make it so it wasn't such an, uh, as bad of an eye chart. We do see other things here, a lot of more zeros. But what we find is that the, the, the touch-up flux had uh, malinate, succinate, glutarate, adipate as the primary activators in the flux. And the activators of the flux are there just to chemically remove the oxide issues to allow the solder to flow and wet. So you have to have an acid that's capable of reacting under temperature um, and remove the oxides and not create another set of, of oxide issues. So it's a balance, um, but you still have to have a strong acid. So we saw the same thing um, on the board surface where the glutarate, the succinate, the adipate, which is very corrosive, um, the malate. So we didn't see any of the other organics that were actually present in the solder paste. So again, there was enough removal and volatilization that it, it just burnt off the rest of these organic acids. Um, again, the same high bromine issues, and we still see acetate in those areas, and that also is present in the uh, flux, uh, touch-up flux. So taking the IC mass spec allows us to put a better um, more detailed analysis and understand what the flux residues are, where they came from, and where do we go back in the process to say, okay, let's find a way to, to eliminate or remove that step of the process that's causing the problem. So you can see that the capacitor that was there um, is a big glob of thermal melted mess. Um, and it's due to the rework flux that was on a nearby part out of frame um, that was brush cleaned and had been brushed into this area. And this primary pin here is the primary power pin coming into the device to set up this, this uh, functional unit to work. Case setter number two, um, looking at an automotive environment, we have a, a wonderful uh, shorting event that occurred on the surface and it was not well understood as to what could be causing these issues um, and they, a lot of people were blaming flux. Um, for those of you that, that are aware, these are, are mechanical inserted um, pin and pay, or um, compliant pin um, connections. So there's no flux, there's no solder in these joints. So there would not have been any reason for flux to have been uh, uh, isolated in this particular area. Um, so we asked them to send us the enclosure and the housing um, just because we got a circuit board with a, a burnt area. A lot of times we'll just get the circuit board and not the whole conditions or the, the housing enclosure. Um, so once we got that, we were able to take a look at everything and we found that, that the outside enclosure um, had a thermal vent and in there there was a, or a, a, a basically it's a fiber vent, it's a, a little vent that keeps the moisture out and supposed to keep all the conditions um, so that there's a pressure relief. But this is the outside of the housing used um, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, very discoloration, a lot of visible uh, debris and, and residue on the surface compared to the inside surface, but there was still some very uh, conductive residues that were present. And when we looked at it with IC mass spec, we found that there was no flux in that residue, but there was very high levels of chloride and acetate and sulfate. Um, so taking a look at that, it was again an outside salt that was deposited on the board surface that was directly in, in relationship to the, the area we're looking at. So taking a look at, at these case studies, um, 
we've actually found that, that there's a lot of issues that impact localized cleanliness. These are a number of the key areas that, that react from the manufacturing process and from the environmental conditions itself. We have to deal with, as electronic reliability is now one of the biggest um, items of, of failure analysis and return um, for many of the OEMs these days, the, the reliability effect is, is usually uh, a, a very large line item in their annual reliability uh, effects. So when they have to pay out money for recalls and pay out money for repair and completely redoing or replacing hardware, um, it, it's becoming a much greater uh, cost burden. We're finding that today's electronics are seeing more recalls um, due to both mechanical and chemical issues um, than any time in, the, in history. So we're trying to help people understand their manufacturing process because we're outsourcing things from what used to be done in-house with one primary manufacturer um, to three or four or five levels of different subcontractors. So we, we try to, to move beyond where where things are. When we look at electronic reliability and hardware performance, we're trying to see the differences of where the technology is and where the changes in process are. Process variation and process variability are, are key things that, that a lot of systems, since we haven't had the ability to monitor the process, um, adequately um, have escaped us, and traditional tools are, are not able to see the system's effect. Rose testing gives you a gross single number for a whole board. Bag extractions of circuit boards for ion chromatography give you a single value for a, a specific um, ion, and it kind of gives you, here's where we're at, but it's a general average over the entire board. And instead of using 2.2 mils of extraction solution, we're using 300 mils. Um, and so now we take that, that 300 mils and we inject 25 microliters into an IC system, um, and you get a very low level of sensitivity. Part of the reason we've done a localized extraction with a very focused small spot area is to understand how to minimize that variability. So I want the greatest reaction to occur in that 25, and, and we push 100 microliter uh, injection loops for all of our systems just because we want to have a greater level of response. Um, we don't need to have high alcohol content columns. We don't need to have columns that will, will uh, uh, give us um, sensitivity to just weird, um, uh, very uh, aggressive uh, organics. Um, but what we do need to have are columns that are stable and have a low baseline that give us an understanding of how we can see very low changes or different levels of sensitivity of near eluding materials. So for acetate, formate, fluoride, um, the methane sulfonic acid, you know, I need to be able to see separation there but I also need to be able to know when I've got a, a swamping uh, large peak, if I've got a gross concentration of a sulfuric acid from an a, a outgassing material or, or from a, an etchant, um, you know, it's going to swamp over and see other things, so I need to be able to dilute it but still not lose the sensitivity of what I'm looking for on the other side, so on the load level detection. Um, but we are able to see the, the, the effects of manufacturing processes, and flux vendors are changing fluxes and the activators that are in fluxes because we're changing all the solder alloys. So we need something that's more stable instead of at 184 degrees C for a tin lead alloy, which rosin was wonderful at, um, to 240 degrees for a tin lead bismuth palladium um, you know, next generation alloy. That, that's going to see a higher temperature reflow, um, that's going to see multiple soldering steps on that same board, so we need to be able to have fluxes that will volatilize off 
the primary uh, corrosive residues um, and leave behind a insulated protective barrier, um, which creates a whole other set of problems. So as I'm going through the reflow process, I volatilize off these corrosive parts of the, of the flux that I don't want on the board, and they condense on larger, taller components or secondary boards that are in a, a vertical state. It's understanding where those residues are coming from and how those residues are going to impact reliability is, is another thing that we've been working on. So it, electronic manufacturing allows us to see the, the, the assembly techniques, and iChromatography and iChromatography mass spec have allowed us to see the chemical um, underpinnings of all those manufacturing processes, and now we can include the outside organic um, and elemental uh, residues that, that have an impact on performance, and we see where we're, we're working from there. So looking at column technology, looking at where we need system support um, is better understanding of, of how to quantify and speciate not only the individual organic analysis, but when we take and blend a lot of the fluxes, and a lot of the fluxes will have three or five um, organic acids. When they do that, you know, what are the degradation states of these blended uh, fluxes and that have gone through partial thermal heating and activation or full thermal heating and activation so that they've gone through a reflow oven two or three times and now we've got um, material that is, has seen 240 degrees um, dwells for 20 to 40 seconds um, as, a, as a peak liquidus phase, but we ramped up from 25C to steady states at 150 to, to 180 degrees C, and now we're thermally breaking down and releasing those chemicals. Um, it, it's understanding what these chemicals are in their various stages and how they are able to react and pull moisture in, set up corrosion cells or parasitic leakage issues is the, the largest thing that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And with that, I have going to open it up for questions.